for pre short shortcuts. Um, thanks for logging to watch this video. Today, we're going to focus on your high-risk drugs. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Marvin Munzo. I'm the co-founder of pre Shortcuts with my um, colleague, Uma Majid. And um, you can visit us on www.preredshortcuts.co.uk. We also have more contact details at the end of this presentation. So let's go straight into it. So today's all about um, high-risk drugs. The reason why this is so important is because um, most of the questions, in fact, on everything that we'll go through today, you're going to have at least one question on each of these um, topics or each of these drugs or group of drugs that's um, what has been recommended or that's what um, we got from the GPHC framework. So basically, that's why it's so important because this is going to come up in your exam. So let's get straight into it for you. And we're going to make the slides bigger. All right. So um, high-risk drugs, this is what we're going to cover today. We're going to go through 20 because there are 20 uh, main high-risk drugs for you to know. Amiodarone in this order as well. So we're going to do them in this order. We're going to have amiodarone, vancomycin, warfarin, gentamicin, NSAIDs, opioids, cyclosporin, tacolimus, methotrexate, diuretics, cardiac glycosides, lithium, carbamazepine, phenytoin, theophylline, oral antiplatelets, antihypertensives, insulin, cytotoxics, and antibiotics. So quite a long list, but um, what we've tried to do for you in this video is to make it easy for you. So what we have is when it comes to your um, high-risk drugs, the main things you need to know is you need to know what they're used for, you need to know the side effects, you need to know um, monitoring for those, especially those that have got narrow therapeutic index, you need to know what to monitor, you need to know interactions, you need to know about the ranges. So that's, we're gonna cover everything in this next couple of slides. So um, I hope you're ready to have fun today. I hope you're willing, you're ready to learn and let's jump straight into it and let's go through this for you so I could pass the exam. So we're gonna start off with Amiel Deron. Um, I'm using the BNF 76, okay? And um, this is on page 105 to 106. So I try to put some references to make it easy for you. So let's look at amiodarone. So amiodarone is obviously used to treat arrhythmias. Um, it's normally given in different doses. So um, at the beginning, when you start taking the medication, it's given us 200 milligrams three times a week. Or so three times a day for one week. And then um, that's reduced to just um, twice a day for a further week. And then you normally have the maintenance dose, which is just 200 milligrams daily. And that's your maintenance. So um, it's important to also know about this dose. So everything we have on the slide is important because this is what may come up in your exam. So 200 milligrams three times a day for one week, then you reduce that to 200 milligrams twice a day for another week. And then your maintenance dose is 200 milligrams daily. Okay, so another important part is to know the side effects of amiodarone that comes up as well on exams. So side effects, we're looking at things like your corneal micro deposits. Main um, advice here is um, you need to advise drivers, especially because um, this may dazzle drivers at night, especially the headlights may dazzle them at night. So they need to be warned about this. Um, also, amiodarone contains iodine. So I've put that in there to help you to remember um, IOD in amiodarone, iodine. That's a good way to remember that it contains iodine. And what that does, it affects thyroid function. So you could either, um, patients could be hypo or they could be hyper, right? So you could either have hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism. Another thing is hepatotoxicity, which is caused by amiodarone. Um, you need to discontinue the medication if you get any signs of hepatotoxicity. So you're looking at signs like jaundice, like dark urine, those are some common hepatotoxic signs. Um, you also have pulmonary toxicity. So you're looking at things here as shortness of breath. So if anyone's on and they're getting them shortness of breath, um, so then you could suspect they've got um, pneumonitis, which is literally just some sort of inflammation of the lungs. And if also cough develops. So um, I'm going to go through this. These are the main sort of side effects from your drone, but you also have other side effects. I um, will mention this, even though it's used to treat, um, to use for arrhythmias, it could still um, cause arrhythmias. Um, so that's not side effects, arrhythmia, um, nausea, and then skin reactions. Um, normally talk about gray slate skin, so sort of grayish skin. Um, so it's important to know the side effects of amiodarone. So another thing is the contraindications. You need to know your contraindications for this medication. So what are the contraindications? Um, 
we, we mentioned this earlier. So thyroid function, right? So of course, um, any patient that's got thyroid dysfunction or any problems with the thyroid, then it's contraindicated because we said amiodarone contains iodine. Um, any patient that's iodine sensitive, okay? Um, then you got sinoatrial heart block, again, connected with your heart. We spoke about arrhythmias as well. Um, we also need to know what you monitor with amiodarone. So what do you need to monitor with patients with amiodarone? Um, common things is, first of all, you need to do a thyroid function test. Um, you've got liver function test um, for hepatotoxicity. We've got um, serum potassium concentration, which needs to be monitored. Chest x-rays and also ECGs. Um, with intravenous use. So these are your main monitoring parameters. Um, in terms of advice as pharmacists, we always need to know what patient advice we need to give for anyone that you dispense um, amiodarone to. So here's what you advise patients. So the first thing is they need to protect themselves from um, the effects of sunlight or from photo, um, because this could cause phototoxic reactions or phototoxicity. And um, amiodarone also has a very long half-life. So even when you stop taking the medication, you could still experience the side effects months later, okay? So this is advice I need to give patients. Um, the best way to protect themselves is to use um, a broad-spectrum um, sunscreen, right? And um, also need to seek any medical um, advice or basically medical attention if they get any of the following symptoms, such as shortness of breath, which we mentioned, that that could be um, pulmonary toxicity, cause signs of pulmonary toxicity, if they've got any lightheadedness, any palpitations, fainting, any unusual tiredness, or chest pain. Um, let's look at the common interactions. So um, there are many interactions. If you go into your BNF, into your appendix one, you see a lot of interactions, but we've tried to highlight probably the main ones for you. So um, as I mentioned earlier, it's got a long half-life. Um, so the interactions could occur even several weeks and months after stopping the medication. Normally you get um, an increase in concentration with um, anti-epileptics, so um, phenytoin, for example. You need to also avoid your calcium channel blockers, especially for rapamil diltiazems, because those could increase the risk of cardio depression. Avoid grapefruit juice with this medication. Um, it increases the anticoagulant effects of cumarin, so like warfarin, increases our plasma concentration of digoxin, which we're going to come into later on, and cyclosporin. Also, lithium as well increases the risk of arrhythmias. And um, amiodarone with statins also increase the risk of myopathy. You could get more of these interactions if you go to page seven, um, so BNF 76, page 134 to 1348, so you could get more of the interactions. But we just try to put some main ones in there for you. So let's look at the next one. Just move to the next slide. So vancomycin, another um, very important medication. Um, BNF page 525 to 526. You may be watching this video later um, with a different BNF, but um, the information is quite similar, but at least this is a guide for you, okay? And just make sure that you're using the right um, version, and if there's any changes, make sure that you're aware of them. So um, vancomycin is what we call a glycopeptide antibiotic, and on our, on our course notes, we go through um, this in detail um, when we cover um, the antibiotic chapter. Okay, we cover all of this in detail. So um, it normally has bactericidal activity. Uh, again, this is all defined and described on the course, explained in more detail. But um, you're looking at, it works against aerobic and anaerobic gram-positive bacteria. You need to know about the indications. Main indications, um, C. difficile infections, also your skin and soft tissue infections, bone and joint infections, um, pneumonia and endocarditis. Those are the main indications for vancomycin. Um, what are the side effects of vancomycin? Very important, you know, side effects. So um, you have quite a few side effects with this medication. A granulocytosis, one of the common ones. You get a lot of neutropenia, you get a lot of um, blood disorders with this medication. A common one which um, makes it stand out as well, a common side effect is what we call red man syndrome, which is just flushing of the upper body. Um, dizziness, drug fever, hypertensivity, um, skin reactions, um, nephrotoxicity, and um, you need to discontinue this if you get any tinnitus, so such a, if you get any ringing ears 
or some sort of autotoxicity, then I need to discontinue um, vancomycin. So what do we monitor with um, vancomycin? Um, obviously now with therapeutic drug, you have what you call your trough concentration, which um, this is going, this is described in more detail on the course, in the course notes. But um, the trough range, you need to know what it range is, normally between 10 to 20 milligrams per liters. We try to highlight things in red as well, just to make the notes easy for you to follow, make it easy for you to understand, and also try to make the most important things stand out. So you got things like your full blood count, leukocyte count, renal, urinalysis, um, um, hepatic function. These are all things that you monitor. Um, you've got your auditory function as well. I need to avoid uh, mainly your drugs that could cause autotoxicity. For instance, um, your loop diuretics, so things like furosemide, um, because those could obviously affect auditory function. Um, let's look at the interactions. So there are quite a number of interactions as well, but let's look at the main ones. So as I mentioned earlier, your loop diuretics, because they can increase the risk of autotoxicity, and vancomycin already has a risk of um, autotoxicity, so that just makes it worse. So increase the risk of the two main ones are your autotoxicity risk and also hepatotoxicity, especially with drugs like your cyclosporine, aminoglycosides. Um, those will really increase um, the risk of hepatotoxicity as well. Um, you could go on to BNF. There is a table um, on page 1334 and um, table 19. So table 2 on 1334 and also table 19 on page 1338 of BNF76. And you could see um, the drugs that cause um, autotoxicity and nephrotoxicity. So it's very a very good table for you to um, go through in order to just learn um, some interactions you need to know. So let's go into warfarin, which is a very big one, page 139. We just covered just part of warfarin because there's quite a lot on warfarin and we have all this detail in the notes. So if you want to get more detail and get the full picture of warfarin and everything you say about warfarin, then we have those. You can access them on the course notes. But we've got key points here for you. So um, you need to know what it's used for. So mainly treatment and also prophylaxis of VTE, right? So you've got your deep vein thrombosis and your pulmonary embolism. Also used um, for AF, atrial fibrillation. Um, vitamin K antagonist. Um, so vitamin K is normally used to reverse the effects of warfarin. Um, in terms of its action, it takes um, 40, 48 to 72 hours. So normally about two to three days to get its full effects. Um, normally given once daily at the same time each day. So these are sort of counseling advice you need to give patients. Uh, main adverse effects with warfarin is um, hemorrhage. Okay, so bleeding. That's the main adverse effect. That's what we really watch out for. And um, patients ionize normally assess every three months. But if they have higher risk of bleeding, they can do that more frequently. Um, now let's look at what we call um, your INR values. So um, previously, we used to look at INR ranges but now you sort of stick to an INR value. So you need to know these values as well and the ranges for exam, right? So INR should normally be within 0.5 units of the target value. So now we focus on target values rather than ranges. And you should normally have your INR within 0.5 units of this target value. So um, let's look at the different values. So for INR um, 2.5, um, it's normally used, um, that's normally the, the target value for treatment of DVT and PE, um, for AF, for cardioversion, mitral stenosis, and dilated cardiomyopathy. Okay, so that's 2.5. Please learn this um, value and also learn um, the different conditions there that have to be within this value. Um, and then you have INR 3.5. And that's normally for recurrent DVT and PE, also mechanical prosthetic heart valve. And so we need to know what to monitor when we're taking warfarin. Um, so in terms of monitoring, there are quite a few things you need to monitor our patients on warfarin. Most important, obviously, and the most common is your INR. You also need to monitor liver function, renal function, full blood count, blood pressure, thyroid function. But I said INR is the most um, common one. Let's look at the side effects. As I mentioned earlier that bleeding is the most important side effect, the most common side effects. The one that we watch out for is your hemorrhage. 
So watch out the patients on getting nosebleeds. Um, normally when they cut themselves as well, it takes a long time for um, things to heal. Um, sometimes some patients get painful skin rash. And then you have what you call blue or purple toe syndrome, which is um, normally happens as a change of the color as, as, it, as from the um, word itself, blue um, toe syndrome. So what happens is most of these patients could have a blue toe or a purple toe, which normally comes from once um, you don't get enough blood going through your blood vessels. So like a blockage to your blood vessels. Okay, so let's um, look at the interactions. Now, warfarin interacts with so many medications, so many medications, but let's look at some key ones here. So um, what I've done is try and make it easy for you. I've put a table, and this table has got two parts. So um, on your left, you've got um, those that increase the effect of warfarin, okay, and then those that decrease the effect of warfarin. All right, the next um, on the right hand side. So let's look at those that increase effects. You have things like cranberry juice, um, pomegranate juice, um, your antifungals, especially meconazole is one that you need to really take note of because we do have an M um, MHRA advice or warning on this medication, and there were in and there was an incident um, of a patient that bought, um, I think, it was dactarin oral gel. And unfortunately, it was an interaction. They were on warfarin, and um, the patient um, was seriously affected, and I think they lost their life. So it's very important. Um, you're going to sell this OTC. And you make sure that the patient is not on warfarin. Um, other drugs that could increase the effects of warfarin are your chlorophenicol, metronidazole, macrolides such as the erythromycin, clarithromycin, also steroids, SSRIs, glucosamine, statins. Um, especially fluvastatin and rosuvastatin. So it's important to know the drugs that increase the effect of warfarins. And you also need to know the drugs that decrease the effects, such as your St. John's wards, alcohol, carbamazepine, most of your anti-epileptic drugs, um, vitamin K, so that could be found in food, in um, green vegetables, in green tea. So it's important that you know the things that um, will affect um, the concentration of warfarin. Let's look at general patient advice. So this is what you advise patients. Um, you need to know your general patient advice with this medication because it is one of the most common medications that you will dispense, that you will um, check from time to time as a pharmacist. So um, as I said earlier, patients need to take at the same time each day. Um, if a patient misses a dose, then they don't need to double up the dose. They just have to carry on as normal and take the next dose like they were gonna do the next day, okay, as normal. So don't double any missed doses. It also ensure that patient has um, a record of the INR. They know what the INR is. They're being um, regularly monitored. They know what dose they're meant to be taking. Um, you need to understand the different strengths of warfarin. They need to know what um, one milligram looks like. They need to know what um, five milligrams look like. So it's very important that you um, explain to patients. They need to know what three milligrams. They also need to know the colors. So you need to know one milligram is brown, um, Blue is three milligrams, and then um, pink is five milligrams. So they need to know the different um, colors, the packs, and the strengths. And you need to explain these to them as pharmacists. Also, you need to advise the patient. They need to inform the GP if um, anything changes. So if they put on new medications, or if the diet changes, especially if they seem to start consuming more um, green leafy vegetables, then they need to inform the doctors so that um, they make sure that there's no interaction or any adverse effects with the warfarins that they're taking. Um, so that's it for warfarin on this um, slides. But as I said, we have more detail, more information. There's a lot more about warfarin, which we cover on our um, clinical course. Um, so we will obviously those down the course. If you want to get access to all the notes on warfarin, um, then we can show you how to do that. But these are the main things that we've put down the slides for you. So let's go into gentamicin. So gentamicin, um, page 509 to 510 in BNF. We'd like to put the references so I can help you to find things quicker. So um, gentamicin is what we call an aminoglycoside. Most people confuse this. Um, most people confuse gentamicin. I think it falls under a different group. <laughs> but it is a, an aminoglycoside, and it's the main one, the aminoglycoside of choice. And um, you need to avoid the oral routes with gentamicin. Main indications are endocarditis, septicemia, meningitis, and pneumonia. So let's look at the common interactions. Common interactions with gentamicin. 
You've got autotoxicity, it's a bit similar to vancomycin, and that's what I was saying earlier. Most people confuse um, vancomycin. Most um, students normally think um, vancomycin is um, an, it's an amino glycoside because it's quite similar to gentamicin, but it is not because vancomycin is a glycopeptide. So please don't mix them up. But um, yes, gentamicin is the most um, is the amino glycoside of choice. It does cause autotoxicity, like vancomycin, especially with loop diuretics. It also causes nephrotoxicity with um, with vancomycin, with cyclosporins, with cephalosporins, and other medications as well. Um, and nephrotoxicity, you find that it's more common with elderly patients because the renal function is not as effective or as efficient. So um, you will get a lot of cases of neurotoxicity, especially with the elderly. So let's look at what you monitor with gentamicin. So what do we monitor? So with gentamicin, we obviously need to monitor. So now with therapeutic drug, we need to obviously monitor plasma concentration. We mentioned about um, nephrotoxicity, so you need to monitor renal function. And um, also spoke about autotoxicity, so that's where you look into your auditory and also your vestibular function. So it's quite similar in a way to vancomycin, but please remember the both different groups, okay? One is a glycopeptide and the other one is aminoglycoside. So let's look at um, how we monitor um, gentamicin. So it's monitored in elderly, especially as we mentioned earlier, patients that are obese, um, cystic fibrosis, patients that have any renal impairment, um, or patients that have very high doses of gentamicin. It's very important to monitor these patients. So what you do is obviously take a blood sample approximately one hour after you've given them an injection of gentamicin. You need to know the definitions between peak and trough concentrations, which we go into a lot more detail on the course as well, on the clinic, in our clinical notes. But um, what I'm going to explain to you is you have what you call a pre-dose or a trough concentration. And um, if this is high, if your pre-dose is high, then you need to increase the dose interval, okay? But if your post-dose or your peak concentration is high, then you need to decrease the dose. So it's just important you know, um, you don't just stop the medication or if it's too high, but what you do is you increase the dose interval. So um, I'll just put a few ranges because you need to know your ranges for your now therapeutic drugs as part of your exam. So for gentamicin, I've just put two there for you to learn. So um, you've got a peak concentration, should be five to 10 from um, used for multiple um, daily regimens. And then you have the regimen in endocarditis, which should be, um, peak should be between three to five. So it's just about learning the slides, memorizing these ranges, and you should be ready to go. So what are the side effects of gentamicin? So in terms of side effects, um, quite similar, as I said, some of it to um, the vancomycin. So um, just like all antibiotics, you will get um, some antibiotic associated colitis, um, blood disorders, um, depression, neurotoxicity, and as we mentioned earlier, vestibular damage. These are the common side effects. So let's go into your NSAIDs. So NSAIDs are very common. Um, we dispense them a lot in the pharmacy. We also sell them a lot OTC. So I'm um, normally used for chronic disease, um, pain, and inflammation, right? So um, majority of the time in pharmacy, we normally use it more common for short-term treatment for mild to moderate pain, especially your mucoskeletal pain. It's normally, um, although ibuprofen, um, so although paracetamol is normally preferred because of less side effects, especially with elderly patients, but um, NSAIDs are normally used a lot for inflammation, mild inflammation or short term. Um, it's quite suitable, quite good for um, period pains, okay? Dysmenorrhea, also pain that's caused by secondary bone tumors, also used for um, pain after surgery. It's important you know about the uses of NSAIDs. You can find this as well, BNF76 on page 1094. So what are the side effects of NSAIDs? Um, so the main side effects are GI bleed. That's what um, the most common one is um, GI bleed, um, black stool, coffee ground vomits, some symptoms. That's how you could identify a patient's having GI bleed. Uh, a common one as well as makes asthma worse. So we know about avoiding selling NSAIDs um, to patients that are asthmatic, except in some cases if they're quite stable. Um, they could probably get away with it, but generally you can make asthma worse and you're better avoiding an NSAID. Other side effects are diarrhea, dizziness, nausea. So what do you monitor with NSAIDs? So main things you monitor are um, hepatic function, renal function, blood pressure, 
Um, for patients that are um, high risk of bleeding, you can monitor the hemoglobin as well. Also just watch out for the signs that we've mentioned earlier, of bleeding such as black stools, such as coffee ground vomit. Um, signs of swollen ankles, um, of swollen feet, and obviously, as we mentioned, worsening of asthma. Always um, take it with food um, to protect um, your stomach and also to prevent any GI ulcers. In terms of interactions, um, NSAIDs interact with a few drugs. Um, some of the common ones um, we need to know are your quinolones. So it normally increases the risk of convulsions with quinolones, right? so, such as your um, ciprofloxacins. Um, also with cumarins, it increases anticoagulant effects, so it could cause a higher risk of bleeding with warfarin. Um, it also increases the risk of bleeding, not only with anticoagulants, but also antiplatelets, with SSRIs, with venlafaxin. Venlafaxin especially, I remember dealing with a patient that came to buy this OTC and they're on venlafaxin. I need to advise them about the use of NSAIDs and that can increase the risk of bleeding. Also increased risk of nephrotoxicity, especially when given with cyclosporin and tacrolimus, and it may reduce um, excretion of lithium. So lithium and methotrexate are... Um, NSAIDs, you need to avoid NSAIDs with these medications because it um, increases toxicity of lithium. It also increases toxicity of methotrexate just by preventing it from being excreted. It causes an ac accumulation in the system, which will lead to toxicity. Um, increased side effects as well when it's used with when NSAIDs are used together with other NSAIDs or with aspirin. So next slide. Let's look at opioids, okay? So these are normally used to relieve moderate to very severe pain, particularly of visceral origin. So in terms of your side effects of opioids, you obviously need to know your side effects. So main side effects are respiratory depression, and this could be reversed with naloxone or artificial um, ventilation. A common one as well is dependence, um, when pay, especially when patients take it for a long time, and also you get withdrawal symptoms. It's also tolerance. Um, in case of overdose, um, this could lead to comas, um, respiratory depression, and pinpointed pupils. Other side effects which are common are drowsiness, dizziness, constipation, dry mouth, flushing headaches, nausea, hallucinations. So you do have a wide range of side effects with opioids. So in terms of monitoring, the main monitoring is we're looking at um, how well it controls pain. So we'll look at the level of pain the patient's experiencing. We're also looking at how much sedation it causes the patient. So these are the two main things we'll monitor, sedation and pain. So um, it's also important you know about what advice because opioids are very common, very common drugs in the pharmacy, which you dispense almost every day, if not every day. So it's important to know what to advise patients. So the main um, advice is drowsiness, and this is also on many of the packages, right, of um, opioids. Um, drowsiness, it may affect performance of skill tasks, such as driving, operating machinery, and these effects can be made worse with alcohol. And also, it's, um, uh, um, you need to avoid any sort of abrupt withdrawal, especially for patients that have taken opioids for a long time. Okay, because that could cause um, withdrawal symptoms. And also, once you've taken it for a long time, then there is dependence and also tolerance. So um, avoid stopping them abruptly. Effects of the opioid um, effects can be reduced by enzyme inhibitors, right? So we also go into detail about interactions in our clinical notes, and you can learn more about um, enzyme inhibitors and enzyme inducers. But um, the effects have been reduced by most enzyme inhibitors. It, um, anticoagulant effects of cumarins are enhanced by tramadol, and um, there's an increased sedation and high potential effects with alcohol, which we mentioned earlier. So let's go into cyclosporin. So it is what we call a potent immunosuppressant. It has a very strong nephrotoxic effect. So one of the common side effects is um, nephrotoxicity. It's normally used in transplant, organ or tissue transplant, and normally it's used to prevent um, rejection, okay? So normally in your bone marrow, kidney transplant, liver transplant, heart transplant, lung transplant, so a wide range of transplants. Um, it's important that it's always prescribed by brand, brand name, so it's important you know that. Um, contraindications of cyclosporin, so we've got uncontrolled infections, 
um, uncontrolled blood pressure and malignancy. These are contraindications. You need to know what to monitor. There's a wide, wide range of things as well. You monitor with um, cyclosporin. You're looking at blood concentration, obviously. Um, um, dermatological and physical examination, liver function, potassium. There is a high risk of hyperkalemia, cyclosporin, and also you need to monitor magnesium. Uh, monitor the kidneys, which you mentioned earlier, because of um, nephrotoxicity. Also, blood pressure needs to be monitored regularly and blood lipids. So what are the side effects of cyclosporin? Um, you have decreased appetite, GI discomfort, diarrhea, skin reactions, flushing, vomiting, encephalopathy, and blood disorders. So let's look at the interactions. Again, so many interactions with cyclosporin, but we've put a few, few of them here for you. So again, your enzyme inhibitors and inducers, um, you can refer to the course notes to know how those all interact with cyclosporin, but increases risk of digoxin toxicity, also increases risk of myopathy with statins, increases the risk of nephrotoxicity with NSAIDs, and um, risk of hyperkalemia with potassium sparing diuretics with ACE inhibitors and ARBs, okay? So it's important that you know the common interactions with cyclosporin. So what is a patient and care advice for cyclosporin? So um, you need to cancel on the administration. As we said, um, you try to stick to the same brand because um, different formulations as well are different. So I um, need to counsel patients on how to use different formulations. Uh, avoid um, UV excessive exposure to um, UV light, including sunlight. Um, avoid using any UVBs or PUVAs in psoriasis or atopic dermatitis. Um, red blood cells, aplasia, bone marrow suppression, um, stick to the same brand, and um, avoid any live vaccine immunizations for patients on cyclosporin. So let's look at tacrolimus, um, another high-risk drug. So it's got a similar mode of action to cyclosporin, which is good. <laughs> it makes it easy to learn. Um, it's also um, neurotoxic, right? So it has a greater neurotoxicity compared to um, cyclosporin. Um, there are many incidences where um, tacrolimus has an effect on the heart, and um, you just got to obviously monitor patients, especially um, cardiomyopathy, which is caused by this medication. So you need to obviously monitor the heart in most patients on tacrolimus. Um, it's also been shown to affect blood sugar um, metabolism, so it could cause um, hyperglycemia. Um, as I said earlier, prescribe like cyclosporin, you need to prescribe this by brand, for example, Prograph or Advagraph. Um, avoid high potassium and excess UV exposure. So what do we monitor tacrolimus? Kidney function, liver function, okay, main ones. Um, as I said, the other things you monitor as well, but you've got to monitor the heart, make sure that there's no signs of cardio or myopathy. So what are the main side effects of tacrolimus? So main side effects are nephrotoxicity, hyperglycemia, CVD, liver toxicity, neurotoxicity, blood disorders. In terms of interactions, um, increased plasma concentrations again with enzyme inhibitors and reduced plasma concentration with enzyme in inducers. So increases of hyperkalemia, I mentioned earlier, and also increased risk of nephrotoxicity, especially when it's given with aminoglycosides or NSAIDs, and also increased plasma concentration of cyclosporin. So let's go into methotrexate, another common medication. It inhibits um, dihydrofolate reductase. We cover methotrexate in more detail as well in our clinical notes. But let's just give you a very quick overview. So important safety advice um, is normally give us a weekly dose I need to advise patients of the dose and also the frequency and the reason for them taking that medication right, and also interactions with other medications. Um, generally, um, safe practice um, normally prescribe only one strength, which is commonly 2.5 milligrams, although there are different strengths, but um, 2.5 milligrams is um, the main strength you want to dispense and prescribe. And that's just um, to help to reduce um, the risk of overdosing. Okay, and to help patients adhere to that dose and it's safer. Okay, so prescription and dispensing label should clearly show the dose. 
it should also show the frequency of admin. So what are the side effects of methotrexate? So in terms of the side effects, blood disorders, very common. So you look at things like your mouth ulcers, sore throats, bru um, bruising, fever. These are very common um, symptoms with methotrexate. Um, liver toxicity. So things like your abdominal pain, dark urine, nausea, vomiting, and then respiratory effects, shortness of breath. So these are some of the side effects you get with methotrexate. And um, in terms of the caution, um, blood count, you need to look into blood count um, because it said obviously affects um, the blood, it affects blood count. So it's important that you monitor that. Um, look at the factors that increase bone marrow suppression, um, GI toxicity, liver toxicity, like I mentioned, pulmonary toxicity. So you need to be very cautious with any of the patients that have any of these um, that have shown to sort of show any of these symptoms or any of the signs or any of the signs of any toxicity. And if you could have to discontinue this, especially if you got some, if you suspect pneumonitis. So um, in terms of what you monitor with methotrexate, monitor um, full blood count, monitor um, kidney function, liver function, and these tests have to be done um, very frequently, every one to two weeks until once the patient is stabilized, then you can do them every two to three months. Um, treatment with um, folinic acid um, may help to reduce some of the toxicity. So that's why it's normally prescribed with folic acid. And that helps just prevent um, methotrexate-induced mucositis or myelosuppression. So what advice do you give patients on methotrexate? Patient care advice, very important. Patients need to report any signs of blood disorders on infection. So as I mentioned earlier, things like your sore throats and mouth ulcers, the patients need to report any of the signs if they experience them. Also signs of your liver toxicity, nausea, vomiting, dark urine, jaundice, um, respiratory effects or so shortness of breath. Um, they need to also avoid self-medication, OTC, aspirin or ibuprofen. We mentioned ibuprofen earlier. So you need to avoid ibuprofen and avoid aspirin, especially OTC. And um, patients need to have a treatment booklet, okay? Methotrexate booklet. In terms of the interaction, it's an increased risk of toxicity, as I mentioned earlier, with NSAIDs. It's an increased risk of toxicity with certain antibiotics, such as your penicillins, cefofloxacin, quite a few antibiotics, but we've put down a few ones here for you. Um, increased risk of hematological toxicity as well when it's given with cotrimoxazole. So let's look at thiazide and related diuretics. So diuretics is quite a big, big one. And we cover all of this in our notes, all of this in the course notes in so much detail, all of the different types in this. But now I'm just going to cover thiazides, but um, your loop diuretics and your related diuretics are all covered in much more detail in our course notes. But um, main overview, um, thiazides normally inhibit sodium reabsorption in the distal convoluted tube. They normally act within one to two hours and the effects could last 12 to 24 hours. Best thing is to give them in the morning rather than in the night so that you don't get any diuresis at night <laughs> and it's a uh, moderately potent examples you need to know your examples such as the bendroflumatizide cotalidone and dapamide i said on the course notes we cover this in more detail and so you can get more information on our notes um in terms of contraindications you need to avoid this hypokalemia hyponatremia hypercalcemia and addison's disease you need to also avoid lithium um sodium because sodium depletion normally increases lithium toxicity, okay? So if you have enticides that are making you lose sodium or can cause hyponatremia, right, you need to avoid lithium because that could increase toxicity due to the loss of sodium. So um, in terms of caution and further information, hypokalemia, one of the common ones that we worry about with thiazide diuretics, and um, this normally occurs with thiazides, it occurs with loop diuretics. Um, the risk are obviously greater with thiazide diuretics. Um, it's quite dangerous in patients with severe CV disease and patients on cardiac glycosides, such as the joxin. And um, you could give potassium sparing diuretics or potassium supplements or encourage patients to um, eat potassium-containing foods, such as bananas. 
And this could lead um, also could lead to um, encephalopathy in hepatic failure, particularly in alcoholic cirrhosis. So it's important that you notice about Tarza diuretics. You also need to about uh, more cautions, especially with the elderly. Elderly are more susceptible to side effects of tyrosides. So normally you start them off with very low doses and then you increase those gradually according to how efficient um, the kidneys work. Um, don't use them obviously long-term for gravitational edema. If the patient's got gravitational edema, you want to encourage them to move around, walk around, raise the legs or use stockings. And they can exacerbate diabetes. They can also exacerbate gout and they can exacerbate lupus. So um, side effects of thiazides, you have your constipation, electrolyte imbalance, headaches, postural hypertension, skin reactions. So I said when, um, the course notes cover diuretics in a lot more detail than this, but um, your other diuretics that cover in the course are your loop diuretics, potassium sparing diuretics, aldosterone antagonists. So we cover all of this in, um, from your diuretics chapter. So if you want to know more about that, click on, our, on that website and you can get more information and you can get access to the course. Um, corticosteroids is a very big one. Again, another one which is because of the detail which is covered on the course. I'm not going to go into this, but um, any, um, you can access the notes and on the notes you get all the details about corticosteroids. But we cover this in so much detail. So let's look at cardiac glycosides. That's a very common drug. Digoxin, my favorite drug. <laughs> Digoxin, page 109 to 110. 108 to 110. So um, it's a cardiac glycoside. And what digoxin does is increases the force of contraction of the heart and also reduces conductivity in your atrioventricular node. It's quite useful for things like AF, um, atrial flutter, and heart failure for patients in sinus rhythm. Um, the maintenance dose is normally um, it's normally determined when the patient's at risk. You're looking at the ventricular rate of um, one which shouldn't fall below 60 beats per minute, okay, persistently. And the response with um, digoxin may take a long time, quite take several hours. And so it's not really suitable if you're going to use it to, um, for rapid sort of intervention. And um, the intramuscular route is not recommended with digoxin. So um, digoxin has a long half-life. So what that means is it could be given just once a day. Um, if a patient experiences some sort of side, some sort of side effects, such as nausea, then you can spread the dose into twice a day. Adult dose is normally 125 um, to 125 to 250 micrograms daily. Um, the dose is normally based on renal function. So that's quite important for digoxin because it's excreted in the, in the, by the kidneys. So renal function is um, very important. We've got a video on this on YouTube. You can watch that video, period shortcuts channel called Two Kidneys, and we'll give you a summary of digoxin. So what are some of the side effects of digoxin? Quite a few side effects. Um, signs of digitalis toxicity, we've got arrhythmias, cardiac conduction disorder, diarrhea, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, skin reactions, and also um, one of the things that distinguishes it is this yellow vision that you get with um, digoxin toxicity. So you need to know about the toxicity range. So now therapeutic drug is normally between 1.5 to 3 micrograms per liter. Special care needs to be taken especially with the elderly because they're more susceptible to the side effects of digoxin, to digoxin toxic, um, digitalis toxicity. So um, with the elderly patients, you normally need to start them on a low dose and they can increase slowly. Um, hypokalemia normally predisposes patients to digitalis toxicity. That's why many patients that are on digoxin are normally given a potassium sparing diuretic so that they don't have low potassium, which would then lead to toxicity of digoxin. So um, give a potassium sparing diuretic or potassium supplement, and we cover potassium sparing diuretics as well under the diuretics chapter in um, our notes, our course notes. Um, but give them potassium supplements to prevent hypokalemia. Now, if toxicity occurs, if the patient um, experiencing toxicity, then you need to withdraw the digoxin. If it's quite serious, then you need to obviously refer them to urgent care. If it's life-threatening, if there's life-threatening overdose, then the effects of digoxin can be reversed with what we call a digoxin-specific antibody fragment, okay, digifab. 
Okay, so what do we monitor with the Juxin? So as an now therapeutic drug, you need to know what you monitor. So obviously, plasma the Juxin concentration because it's now a therapeutic. Uh, monitor your electrolytes. So magnesium, calcium, potassium. Monitor renal function. And normally need to reduce the dose for patients that are renally impaired. Um, also monitor the heart rate. So let's look at interactions. The Juxin has many interactions. Main ones I've got for you is St. John's Wort. So this reduces plasma concentration of the joxin. You also get um, hypokalemia, like I mentioned earlier, which is normally caused by diuretics, could um, increase the risk of digitalis toxicity. And we spoke about NSAIDs and ACE inhibitors can also alter the joxin concentration. So these are the main interactions I've put down here for you, but I said we have a lot more on our course notes. So let's go into another um, very common medication, which comes out a lot in your exam. Now therapeutic is your lithium. Okay, so lithium has several indications, normally used for treatment and prophylaxis of mania, bipolar, recurrent depression, aggressive or self-harming behavior. You need to know about the contraindications of lithium. So um, dehydration, um, low sodium, untreated hypothyroidism, and Addison's disease. These are all contraindicated with lithium. So you gotta make sure your patient's always hydrated when they're on lithium. So um, with lithium, you need to avoid any abrupt withdrawal. Any um, treatment with diuretics will normally increase the risk of toxicity because again, we mentioned that any dehydration will increase that risk of lithium toxicity. Um, you also get QT interval prolongation. So you need to be very cautious with this. You need to reduce the dose in patients, especially those that lose a lot of liquid, such as they got diarrhea or the elderly patients or vomiting or any sort of intercurrent infection. Um, Long-term use of lithium has also been um, connected with thyroid disorders and also memory impairment. Um, for long-term treatment, obviously you need to monitor thyroid function every six months and you need to assess the need of continuous therapy for most patients, especially after three to five years and see if um, they're getting benefits from the medication. So what are the side effects of lithium? So many side effects of lithium, and I've put um, a few of them on there for you. So just make sure you learn the side effects, especially tremor, arrhythmias, weight gain. Learn the side effects, because they normally come up in your exam in different ways. But these are also the signs of lithium overdose. So quite a number of um, signs for overdose, quite a number of side effects, and you need to learn them. So um, in terms of pregnancy and breastfeeding, um, it's normally avoided in breastfeeding. Avoid in because it could be present in milk and it's quite toxic. So avoid in the first trimester especially um, because of risk of teratogenicity. And then those requirements normally increase when you get to the second and third trimester. So in terms of what you monitor, in terms of the ranges, you um, essentially got two sort of ranges. So um, as a now therapeutic drug, you can now take the blood sample every 12 hours. And um, you can have the range of 0.4 to 1 millimoles. This is what we call the lower end of the range. And this is normally for maintenance and for elderly patients. So we normally look at the lower, lower end of, of the range, which is 0.4 to 1. Then you have what we call the higher end of the range, which is 0.8 to 1 millimoles per liter. And this is normally for acute episodes of mania and for patients who previously had a relapse. So you need to know um, the lower end of the range, what that's used for maintenance and for elderly patients, while the higher end of the range, which is 0.8 to 1, that's normally for mania and any patients that um, have previously relapsed. Um, routine serum lithium concentration should be performed weekly after initiation and each dose is then changed until the patient is stable and once that patient is stable you can then monitor them every three months and uh, before you initiate lithium you need to check the heart, check thyroid function, check renal function, check BMI, full blood count and also electrolytes. Um, do not stop lithium abruptly. Okay, so abrupt discontinuation can increase the risk of relapse. So don't stop them abruptly. Make sure you do it gradually over a period of at least four to three months, four weeks to three months. And if lithium is stopped or if it's discontinued for any reason, 
then um, you could change that to an atypical antipsychotic or valproate. Again, we cover antipsychotics in detail and valproate on the course notes. So um, in terms of patient care advice, quite a few important things you need to tell the patient. So um, they need to report any signs and symptoms of lithium toxicity. So the list of um, signs and symptoms, side effects that we went through, patients need to know what they are and they need to also report them if they experience any of them. Um, hypo, any signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism, renal dysfunction, um, including polyuria, so they're going to toilet, um, passing urine more, or the increased thirst, polydipsia, um, benign um, intracranial hypertension. So if they get any sort of persistent headaches or they get any sort of visual disturbance, then that needs to be reported. Also, um, they need to maintain an adequate um, fluid intake so as to prevent any dehydration that will increase the risk of lithium toxicity. So they need to keep themselves hydrated all the time. And also avoid any sort of dietary changes which may reduce or increase sodium intake. Um, and patients need to also be given a lithium treatment pack. And you have examples of some um, lithium brands like your Pridel and Lisconum. So what drugs increase lithium concentration? So these are a list of the main ones I've got for you. There are other ones, some main ones. So ACE inhibitors increase the concentration of lithium that could lead to lithium toxicity. Diuretics, loop and tie diuretics, NSAIDs and antiepileptics. So let's look at another now therapeutic drug. Let's look at carbamazepine, another common drug. So it's a drug of choice for simple and complex focal seizures. And I won't go so much into seizures because again, in the course notes, we cover this in so much detail. We explain every single thing about seizures and definitions and make it so easy for you to learn and to absorb. But um, carbamazepine is normally av avoided in absence, tonic, atonic, and myoclonic seizures, which we explain those different terms as well in the, in the course notes. And um, these may exacerbate um, symptoms. Again, I've on the refer to course notes if you want to know the detail and definitions of each of these different seizures. But um, you need to know the range for carbamazepine. And the range is normally between 4 to 2 milligrams per liter. And with carbamazepine, I mean, stick to the same brand. So like Tegretol, for example. Make sure you stick to the same brand because different preparations have different bioavailabilities. So you need to know what the side effects of carbamazepine are. So common side effects, um, headaches, ataxia, drowsiness, nausea, vomiting, blurred vision, allergic skin reactions. You get a lot of uh, blood, blood disorders as well. And it's more common that one, you get these effects once you start um, the medication. And by giving um, a modified release preparation, that can help to reduce some of the side effects. Uh, I'll say it could cause blood disorders, it could cause um, liver and skin disorders. I need to seek medical attention if you have any other signs such as fever, rash, sore throat, mouth ulcers. So that means signs of blood disorders. So what do you monitor with carbamazepine? In terms of monitoring, you monitor the full blood count, uh, monitor renal function, monitor liver function. So let's look at interaction. So this is on page 1350 and 1,251, 1,252. So if you go to page 1,250, then you can start seeing some of these interactions. So there are so many interactions with carbamazepine, but again, we've put down some key ones for you. So it decreases the efficacy of antifungals. Antifungals also increase concentration of carbamazepine. Carbamazepine decreases concentration of calcium channel blockers, such as your verapamils and diltiazem. It also decreases effects of warfarin. It decreases effects of um, levonorgestrel. So that's very important as well. If you're going to sell the pill to anyone, you're going to sell the morning after pill, then um, carbamazepine decreases the efficacy of it. Um, macrolides, um, clavitromycin, erythromycin all increase the concentration of carbamazepine. So we're going to look at, into phenytoin, another narrow therapeutic drug. So phenytoin base and phenytoin sodium preps are not um, equivalent. So you need to know that they are not um, bioequivalent. Um, patients need to be on the same brand with phenytoin. I need to also know the target range, which is 10 to 20 milligrams per liter. Side effects of phenytoin, um, toxicity, nystagmus, diplopias, slurred speech, 
ataxia, confusion, hyperglycemia, some of the common um, side effects you get. You need to discontinue phenytoin if a rash develops. You also get a lot of blood and skin disorders, rickets, osteomalacia. So it's important that you know about your side effects of phenytoin because it is an out-of-pretic index drug. It does come up in the exam. I remember you're going to get at least one question in the exam from these drugs. So what do we monitor? Full blood count, liver function, blood pressure and ECG, serum concentration, and your vitamin D levels. So we're going to move into tear filling, um, BNF 76, page 272 to 274. This is covered as well in more detail in our notes um, when we cover chapter 3 of the BNF. So it's a xanthine and it's used um, as a bronchodilator in asthma and stable COPD. It's normally given by injection as aminophylline, which is normally 20 times more stable than theophylline on its own. It's metabolized in the liver and its concentration is normally increased with um, heart failure, with hepatic impairment, with viral infection. Um, a very important one is the effects of smoking on theophylline. So um, theophylline concentration is normally decreased um, in smokers or patients that um, drink alcohol. So those adjustments may be necessary in these, especially in smokers. Um, so for patients that stop smoking while they're on theophylline, this could affect um, theophylline, so the dose normally needs to be looked at and the dose needs to be adjusted. Um, just like phenytoin, with theophylline, you need to stick to the same brand. In terms of monitoring, you need to monitor, um, because now with therapeutic drug, monitor the plasma theophylline concentration, monitor potassium serum concentration, and the range is 10 to 20 milligrams per liter, and, it's, um, required, and that's required normally for satisfactory bronchodilation. Although you could use them um, a lower end, 5 to 15 milligrams per liter, but generally 10 to 20 milligrams per liter is not be fine. Um, for, bron for bronchodilation. So in terms of the caution with theophylline, main one is CVD, your cardiovascular disease. Elderly patients need to be careful. Um, patients got fever, hypertension, peptic ulcer, and um, any patient with a risk of hypokalemia. So perhaps patients on diuretics. So what are the side effects of theophylline? Main side effect is serious hypokalemia with beta-2 agonist. So that's a very important reaction or interaction that you need to know. Is the interaction between theophylline and a beta-2 agonist, and you get serious hypokalemia. Other side effects are things like anxiety, tremor, vomiting, nausea, arrhythmias, GI problems, skin reactions, and sleep disorders. So I've just um, a repeat of some of those interactions. Um, serious hypokalemia with beta-2 agonists, um, increased risk of convulsions with quinolones, increased risk with, with quinolones, of convulsions. Smoking, as I mentioned earlier, normally increases um, theophylline clearance. Therefore, you need to increase the dose of theophylline for smokers. And theophylline normally decreases lithium concentration. So if you go to Appendix 1, um, page 1488, to 1489, you can get a lot more interactions of theophylline. So let's look at your oral antiplatelet drugs. So you're looking at things like your aspirin, your clopidogrel, your dipiridemol. These are the common antiplatelet drugs, and do not confuse this with anticoagulants. So um, the decreased platelet aggregation and the inhibit thrombus formation in the arterial circulation. So um, using aspirin as for primary um, prevention is not advised because there's no benefits. It's normally used for secondary prevention for patients that already have established cardiovascular disease, so not for primary prevention. Um, if a patient has a high risk of bleeding, then you could give them a potent pump inhibitor, such as omeprazole. And um, there's also an increased risk of bleeding when you combine different antiplatelets. So if you combine aspirin with clopidogrel, then you increase the risk of bleeding. So what do we monitor with our antiplatelets? We monitor renal function, liver function, and most importantly, signs of bleeding, and also GI ulcers. So um, you need to know about um, dipyridamol. Normally with a modified release, um, you need to, uh, capsules. You normally need to discard them six weeks after opening the original container. You need to always take, um, these medications with food or after food because they can have a very strong infection in your stomach, they cause bleeding, they cause stomach ulcers, 
and that PVD mold should be taken 30 to 60 minutes before food. So um, interactions, um, if you use more than one antiplatelet, then you have an increased risk of bleeding. Um, antifungals decrease efficacy of clopidogrel. SSRIs also decrease the efficacy of clopidogrel. And um, clopidogrel increases exposure to statins. And proton pump inhibitors decrease efficacy as well of clopidogrel. So antihypertensives, this is very, very big with a lot of information. And we cover this um, on the notes. We spend about four hours just covering your cardiovascular topics. So um, this is covered in our notes on the cardiovascular, um, the cardiovascular chapter, where we have a detail of every single antihypertensive and everything you need to know on them. So um, you can refer to chapter two of the BNF. And also we've got a number of YouTube videos that cover a lot of antihypertensives. So we wouldn't cover that here, but if you refer to course notes, you can get all that information. Same goes for insulins. Um, insulin, a very massive, massive chapter as well. We cover that in detail in the course, chapter six, high, um, high weighted topic. So if you want to know more about insulins in more detail, then you can access course notes. But diabetes is course, I'll just go through this. Diabetes is caused by insulin deficiency or resistance to its actions. Um, you need to know about the advice, the DVLA advice. So all drivers um, treated with insulin must inform the DVLA. And um, advise drivers to avoid any hypoglycemia um, and also to know the signs and the warning symptoms of hypoglycemia and also what actions to take. And this is all explained in detail as well on our course notes. Um, alcohol normally masks the signs of hypoglycemia. Um, use insulin regimens to, optim um, to achieve optimal blood glucose levels. Also, you need to monitor blood glucose and HbA1c. Watch out for signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia and diabetic ketoacidosis. So all these terms are defined in more detail on the course notes. Um, insulin, we covered every single aspect of insulin and everything you need to know in the course notes. So what are the signs of hypoglycemia? You need to know what the signs of hypoglycemia are because they normally come up in your exam. So let's go through some of them. So we've got shaking and trembling. We've got sweating, pins and needles, lips and tongue, hunger, palpitation, headaches, double vision. And those that I've mentioned in, um, I've highlighted in red are normally those that are more serious and that need um, some very urgent attention. So difficulty concentrating, confusion, unconsciousness, change of behavior, slurring of speech and convulsions. All of this require um, urgent attention. And these are all signs of hypoglycemia. So um, I've got um, a list of certain factors that could increase and that could decrease insulin requirements. Again, this is covered in more detail with more explanations in the, on the course notes. But um, the, you need to know the factors that decrease insulin requirements such as physical activity, intercurrent illness, reduced food intake, impaired renal function, and certain endocrine disorders. You need to also know, that, know those that increase, such as infection, stress, accidental, or surgical trauma. So we cover this again in detail on the course, and we'll give you all the explanations of each of them and how that works. So in terms of patient care advice, you need to check the patient is, um, has an insulin passport, um, check that the patient knows how to use the um, device, the diabetic device, you know how to use the um, glucose meters, they know how to inject themselves, they know on um, what sites, they know how to rotate those sites, they know how to identify any signs of infection on injection sites, um, and they know how to dispose of the sharps. It's very important, and they have the right injection technique. So it's important that you check all of this, and also um, the prescription should normally stay the dose in units and not as abbreviations. Interactions, you're looking at things like um, interacting with fibrates, with oral anti-diabetics, a lot of interactions, ACE inhibitors, um, mouse immunoamine oxidase inhibitors, um, this drugs normally increase the risk of hypoglycemia. Also, um, beta blockers not the main master symptoms, the main master symptoms of hypoglycemia, same as alcohol. So it's important that you learn this. I said, um, I've got down there referred to our clinical notes for um, full slides. Also, you can access the full slides of this if you want to get the slides um, for everyone that's in our course. 
you get the slides given to you and you could um, download them, you could print them, you could read directly from the slides, you could highlight them, so you could, have, you could actually have access to the slides in detail. So let's look at um, chemotherapy. I think this is the final one. Let's look at cytotoxic drugs. We cover this in a lot more detail as well on the course notes. So have, they have both um, chemotherapy or cytotoxic drugs normally have both anti-cancer activity and also they could damage your normal tissue. So they do both. Um, they're normally given to prolong life, cure or to help symptoms. You need to always balance the benefits to the risk because of the side effects of these medications. And the side effects normally occur within days or weeks once you've taken the medication. I need to be aware of what the symptoms are. And most of them are normally teratogenic and should normally be avoided in pregnant ladies, especially um, during the first trimester, where they have a higher risk of causing um, teratogenic activity. Normally exclude pregnancy before you treat the patient with any cytotoxics. So what are some of the side effects of cytotoxic drugs? So you have extravasation of intravenous drugs. This is defined in detail as well in our course notes. You've got oral mucositis, um, which um, could be prevented by good oral hygiene. And you've got tumor lysis syndrome and hyperuricemia. So all of these are defined, described in detail in course notes and exactly what you need to do to prevent those side effects. So other side effects are things like a bone marrow suppression, which is normally caused by all cytotoxics except bincristine and bleomycin. Um, you need to check blood counts before treatment. You need to treat any infection before starting cytotoxic drugs. Um, advise patients to see the doctor promptly if they have any signs of infection. I need to treat infections with antibiotics or um, blood transfusions for anemias. So it's very important that you know this about cytotoxics, but as I said earlier, we cover that in a lot more detail on the course. Um, we've got alopecia, more side effects, but this is normally re reversible. So reversible hair loss. Um, for pregnancy and reproductive function, as we mentioned earlier, uh, they're normally teratogenic. So you need to avoid them, especially in the first trimester. And before anybody gets, any lady gets treated, um, with um, any cytotoxic, you need to make sure that they're not pregnant. So you need to exclude pregnancy and also provide um, contraceptive advice before for patients before they start chemotherapy. So again, you need to um, refer to the course notes if you want to get more information on antibiotics. So our next thing is antibiotics or antibacterials. That's chapter five of the BNF. And again, we covered those for four hours. We've got detailed notes on this, on every single thing you need to know about antibiotics, every single point you need to know and how you can answer them in exam questions. So this is all in our course um, lecture notes. So if you access them, you get all the information on antibiotics. So thank you very much. So that's it for um, our narrow to appetite drugs. We've gone through um, the main ones, your high-risk drugs. For more information, I said you can get more detailed notes. If you if you find this beneficial, they could get a lot more detailed notes by accessing the course lecture notes, all right? And um, you can access our website as well for more information to learn more about what we offer. You could go to um, www.preredshortcuts.co.uk. Um, you could follow us on Facebook. We post a lot of good content on Facebook. We've got summary sheets for you that you can learn good summaries for all the different BNF chapters. We've got MEP, we've got calculations. So you just need to um, follow us, like our page, which is the pre read shortcut. So you can search that on um, Facebook. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. So we tend to post a lot of videos and we're doing more and more videos, summary videos. We have a lot of videos on cardiovascular system. We have a lot of videos out there for you, how to re um, revise your BNF. So if you um you can subscribe to our channel, pre-read shortcuts, and you'll be notified of any new video releases, which we do quite a lot of. Um, you can follow us on LinkedIn and on Instagram by pre-read shortcuts. So just use search for pre-read shortcuts on Instagram and LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and you could follow us. Um, we also do a lot of free webinars, and we have um, a mailing list as well, which is free to join. So um, we have the link on our Facebook page, or you can email us at gphccourse at gmail.com. So send us any emails. If you have any questions, if you'd like to know anything about the course, you want any information, just send us an email and we're going to reply to you straight away. So um, we've got a mailing list with hundreds of period students, and it's a free list where we constantly send questions to students. We send them revision material, updated information, 
calculations, free webinars, any posts, videos, a lot of support material. And this is free to join. And all you need to do is you can go on our website or on our Facebook page and you can join the mailing list or just email us and we're going to send you the link. We also have a Telegram group with over 100 students. And the Telegram group is very active, constantly have questions and many students help each other go through um, revision chapters together. So it's a very active group and it's worth joining that group. Again, it's a free group to join, but we have a lot of free resources to help you succeed. So thank you very much. You can access all our course notes in a lot all, in a lot more detail. So if you like what you've seen here, you can get a lot more detail from this by just um, on our BNF, on MEP and calculations. Again, visit our website, join our live courses. We do a lot of free live courses. We've got automated courses as well. If you want to download a range of the BNF um, or some of the videos, if you wanted all of that, you can just um, go to our website or you can send us an email and we're going to reply to you immediately. So thank you very much. And I hope this is quite long, but I hope this has helped you to understand your high-risk drugs. Remember, it's so important because you're going to get at least one question from each of them in your exam. So I wish you all the best. Believe in yourself and good luck in your exams. Bye.